for Capella, I developed a sound installation and the reason why I like installations is that it gives you the opportunity to have an experience in the space, a real-time experience in the space that you cannot have reading about it or looking at a photo of the thing. So in this installation you can encounter two objects that are actually very familiar. It's a trolley, uh, the trolleys that we use for traveling, and a plastic water bottle, a PET 1.5 liter water bottle that is empty. And these objects are removed from their usual purpose and they are basically abandoned or left alone. They have a collision or an accident together. So the trolley is sitting on top of the water bottle crushing it with its handle and moving very slowly back and forth, constantly crushing the water bottle and creating a sound. So it's almost like a conversation between the two, but using their own particular languages. This for me was a good way to be able to encounter these objects once again, but to render them strange so that as if I don't know who they are and I have to rethink what they are and what their purpose is. When you look at the history of these two objects, they haven't been around very long. The trolley was invented in 1989 and the water bottle, the first plastic water bottle, uh, was produced in, in 1947. So it's not a very long time. Still, the way that they have entered our reality, they have become uh, so inevitable that um, we cannot imagine the world without them. For me, it's kind of fascinating how we allow all these objects to enter our world so confidently and happily um, while we don't really know what they do to us. I mean, we kind of think that we choose them because they are convenient. But I'm also interested in this question, how these objects might have chosen us, how they might even use us. This might sound funny, but maybe there is a very funny mo moment in, in this relationship between us and objects that we, in my opinion, that we need to rethink. The installation gives the opportunity to encounter these two objects again and then to spend time with them on a different plane because the sound that this encounter between the two or this collision produces is then amplified and distributed into the space of the capella, which is, as most churches, also architecturally designed to amplify and to enhance sound through these arches in the side chapels and through the way that the ceiling is shaped. So um, the speakers that play the sound of the crushing water bottle, they are directed into the arches and into um, the ceiling so that the sound of the crushing water bottle is reflected back by the space and filtered through the space. And because each speaker has a different delay, it's almost as if there's um, different echoes produced. So the water bottle makes a sound and then the sound echoes back from all the side chapels in different rhythmic patterns. Uh, it's almost as if it becomes a sort of music. I mean, it's a strange music. The way I, I enjoyed it most was to lie on one of the benches and to just listen to it for a long time. And I th this is a nice opportunity to think about the water bottle, the trolley and some other things that are connected to it. One of the elements that is missing in this situation with the water bottle and the trolley is that the water bottle is empty, right? And water comes to us in various different ways. We're used to drink water from bottles now, but um, there has been a time when there were public fountains everywhere. And actually in Barcelona, and that's what I found out, there's still a lot of public fountains even still now in use. So when I started doing the research for this, I read a lot about the history of water in Barcelona. And it's a very specific history and a very interesting story. At the same time, you will find similar stories in other places. It's also in a way a typical story. In the middle of the 19th century, there was a private water company founded. It was actually founded in Belgium, but it was 
a private water company for Barcelona. And it was in the beginning working side by side next to the public water distribution system that was run by the city council. Um, the city council was um, kind of sloppy with the water distribution and there was a period when many people died of typhus and other diseases because of that. So people who were wealthy, they would prefer the private company's service. That's why the wealthier class used the service of the private water company, which was called Sociedad General de Aguas Barcelona, and the rest of the people used the public service. Now, there was a short period between 1936 and 1939 where this private water company was collectivized by the anarchist. And this was the first time that the pipes were extended into the poorer neighborhoods and the water distribution was improved for the poorer classes. Anyways, after these three years, the company was privatized again and it's still the company now called Agbas uh, that runs the water services. Agbas was 2008 and um, bought by um, Suez Environment, which is an even larger company that operates worldwide and does water and waste management. This is kind of a typical story, but these three years of collectivization is a very specific part of this story that is referred to in the exhibition with two historical documents that you find in the small chapel next to the main space. It's a photograph by David Seymour, who spent the whole time of the Spanish Civil War documenting uh, the Republican side with his photography. And the photograph shows a scene in Gran Vía uh, shortly after a bomb had dropped there in one of the buildings, but there's a public fountain there. A man is carrying a jar and he's filling it with water at this public fountain. Uh, the other document is a, an excerpt of uh, George Orwell's homage to Catalonia. He was joining the international brigades during the Spanish Civil War and he describes the way that he encounters Barcelona during that time in the face of the collectivization and he's very enthusiastic about it and romanticizing it basically. Then there's one more footnote, which is, it's a sculpture resembling a public fountain, the kind of drinking fountains that you find in gyms, for example, or in, in other places like that. But this drinking fountain is a fake one. It's, it's made of IKEA catalogs in f five different languages, and they're piled up, and then the top layer has a basin cut out, and there's a straw, you know, a, a plastic drinking straw coming out of one of the edges, acting as if it was um, a tap. So we have a connection between the water bottle, the public fountain in the photograph uh, from 36, and the IKEA sculpture. The thing that interested me was that while the water bottle seems to be an object that is very present in our reality and has I would say a lot of agency, the public fountain has kind of almost disappeared. Even though it still exists, it doesn't seem to have the same agency as it had before. And this is a peculiar phenomenon that, you know, while one object comes to the front and has this felicity and, and you know, the success story, the other one suddenly, you know, moves into the background and even though it still exists, seems to almost have no function anymore. And why is this? You know, why do these things happen? The public fountains in Barcelona still exist. The only people that see them are probably tourists who think, oh, this is a nice uh, fountain. I will take a photograph of it. The way I found them was actually through a blog on the internet, a woman who has a dog and because of her dog, she always looks for public fountains. <laughs> and she's also, she came to Barcelona as a tourist. This was the only reason why I became aware of that. Since I came back to Barcelona, I suddenly noticed, of course, in every square, there's so many fountains in Barcelona. Researching the, the history of the water was part of a wider and longer research that actually started at the square in front of Magba when I first visited, because during the day, it's very much alive and there's, as soon as it gets a bit cooler in the summer, 
the skaters come and they use the square for skating and there's all, lots of different communities using the square. Accidentally I came back to the square uh, late at night, it was almost morning, and I encountered a very different aspect or a different reality of the square, which is the cleaning process. So the way that it happens is that in the morning the police comes to secure the square and to see if there's people sleeping there or preparing the square basically for the cleaning vans to come in and to prepare the square for the next day. So it's as if they are the missing link in the circle which makes this whole machinery work so well that you know during the day you have almost like a performance or a theater piece you have you know this this cultural life there um, with all its, its different ambivalences a little bit edgy a little bit you know radical but also kind of fun producing a lot of waste of course um, also and then only at night you can see that there is a level of acceptance of, or acknowledgement by the city by cleaning it again and preparing it for the next day because the city knows very well that this is part of the attraction of the city and part of the tourism industry. So this was kind of the starting point to think about these logics of how cities are sold today and you know how this whole circle includes traveling but also waste production. I just felt like there's something here in this circle that is interesting to look at much more deeper. The second moment that I refer to later on is that I was going back to Berlin. I was standing in the queue at the airport in one of these cheap low-cost airlines and I was there with my trolley the same as everybody else. It just seemed very interesting to me that you know that I'm traveling with the very same trolley to the very same cities, staying in the very same hotels, using the same airlines with the people who decide to have a short holiday in, in Barcelona or in any other city. So there's also a logic in the way that artists travel and tourists travel. There's a link and this is also important to look at because m maybe we're part of the same culture or of the same uh, industry. So from there I started to research the history of how the city developed, how does the waste management work in Barcelona. And from the waste management, I mean one of the most obvious elements in waste is plastic and the plastic bottles that especially people who, who are traveling, the most convenient thing is to always have a water bottle with you. From there it was very logical to look at what is inside the plastic, it's, it's water, and then what is the story of water? So while you could be very specific in the research, it always connected back to things happening in other places that make it in a way typical to an extent that it's almost abstract, you know, it's abstract patterns that are just happening all over the place. I think it's really necessary to go into the detail and to look at each object and to see why is this here? Why do we use it? And what do we use it for? And what's the purpose of all this? I mean, basically all the information is out there and you just have to read it. And it doesn't seem to change much that we know that the plastic of the bottles that we use is not going away. We know this and we feel bad about it, but we're not uh, doing anything about it. So information doesn't change anything. I think that we need to find new models of re-encountering our realities in order to, to question and start to change them. I really strongly believe that experiences are what have the power to change us. Experiences with the object culture that we are engaged with. So basically all the research about you know, the square and the economy of the square, the economy of the city, the economy of the waste management of the water, of the tourism industry and all these factors, they are all included in, in a trolley and a water bottle in some strange way. But then these objects also have a life on their own and they have their own logic. And this is why I decided that it's actually good to, to reduce it to these two objects and to just look at them for a while and say, okay, let's start from here. <laughs>